Hi, everyone. Well, so um, when I lined up this, this talk, um, I thought that the Motherwell print show that was over at the Bruce Museum was still going to be on. And it turns out I was wrong. They took it down two weeks ago. But there is a fabulous retrospective of Motherwell's work that's working its way across. Actually, it, it was down in Texas. It's now in Europe. Unfortunately, is not coming to us. Um, but there are a couple of galleries that focus on Motherwell's work uh, in New York City who have done fabulous shows of this stuff. Kasman is one of them, and Mnuchin is another. Both of them do carry his work. They've had some big shows of his things, and they will again in the future at some point. But for now, I'm going to delve into Robert Motherwell. Um, he is someone who, whose work I have kind of tangentially admired over the years, but never really dug into until now. So I'm kind of using you as my excuse to really um, learn more about his work and, and, uh, and what he's about. Um, so to start with, we have this image right here, the studio. And it is a, a precursor, a message, a, a um, uh, in fact, in 1987, it would have been a synopsis <laughs> of his appreciation of Matisse. So in a certain way, this is an homage to Matisse's Red Studio. Uh, and I will talk a lot more about that as we go along. Um, but basically, the, the, the notion of, of, of the color plane, the line um, as, a, as a defining um, uh, mark to, to clarify planes on the surface of a canvas is something that Motherwell explored. And, and I'm gonna talk a lot more about that, so don't try and understand it right now. I'll show you examples and we'll get there. Robert Motherwell was an American abstract expressionist painter, printmaker, and writer. He was one of the youngest of the New York school, uh, which included Willem de Kooning, Jackson Pollock, Mark Rothko, and uh, many others. Uh, Trained in philosophy, Motherwell became an artist regarded as, as among the most articulate spokesmen and, and founders of the abstract expressionist painters. He was known for his series of abstract paintings and prints, which touched on political, philosophical, and literary themes, such as the elegies to the Spanish Republic. And we're going to go into a lot more depth on that one. So I'm going to push us forward. Here we go. Motherwell was born in Aberdeen, Washington in 1915, but spent much of his childhood in California, where he um, was sent to alleviate his asthma. Robert grew up during the Great Depression, haunted by uh, the fear of death. His father was president of Wells Fargo Bank. Robert was a talented artist even as a child and received a fellowship to Otis Art Institute um, in Los Angeles at the age of 11. He attended the, the art school but uh, didn't decide to devote himself to painting until 1941. Um, he was quite well educated. Um, studying liberal arts, aesthetics, philosophy at Stanford. His father wanted Robert to pursue a career in business. As a compromise, Motherwell went for his PhD at Harvard so he could teach at the university level. His thesis at Harvard was, no piker this guy, 
his thesis at Harvard was on the aesthetic theories of the painter Eugene Delacroix, um, 1798 to 1863, one of the leading artists of the French Romantic period. He therefore spent um, 1938 and 39 in France uh, more to more completely immerse himself in this study. Shortly after returning to the United States, he moved to New York City and began to seriously devote himself to painting. He studied at Columbia University with art historian Meyer Shapiro, whose name you may or may not be familiar with, but he was one of the scholars on Cezanne and modernism. Um, Motherwell, often asked Shapiro for critiques of his developing work. Shapiro, out of an act of self-preservation, introduced Motherwell to a group of expatriated surrealist artists living in New York, Max Ernst, Marcel Duchamp, André Breton, André Nisson, and André Breton. Um, um, Motherwell had his first solo show in 1944 at Peggy Guggenheim's gallery, um, Art of This Century, um, also showing works by Kandinsky, Mondrian, Pollock, Hoffman, Rothko, Clifford Still, among others. Um, it represented an exciting mixture of time, place, and cultures. Okay. So um, the Surrealists introduced Motherwell to a number of concepts, uh, collage and automatic writing as a means to open up access to the unconscious. Um, invited to participate in a group collage show, Motherwell got together with Jackson Pollock not, neither one of whom had ever done collage, and they just got together in 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 um, Pollock's studio and did a whole series of things. Um, they w worked separately, but they were you know kind of giving each other feedback while they were working along, and they were included in the show at at uh, one of Guggenheim's um, exhibitions. Uh, okay. As a preface to the catalog to his first show, um, Motherwell said, it was said, with him, a picture grows, not in the head, but on the easel. From a collage through a series of drawings to an oil, a sensual interest in materials comes first. So this is speaking of, of, you know, Motherwell's appreciation of the process of the, of the actual tactile experience of, of creating the work. And I'm going to focus in on quite a few of these collages because I think they're really beautiful pieces. And I wasn't all that familiar with them. Um, so this, this was fun. If you have any questions as I'm going along, throw them in the chat and, and Joan, if they're relevant right now to what I'm talking about, she'll feed them to me. Otherwise, I'll you know answer questions at the end. Okay, and here's a, a photo of Motherwell in, in his Greenwich, Connecticut home. Um, he had a, um, a, a studio devoted to collage, a studio devoted to painting, and a studio devoted to drawing. Um, so, all right. Uh, the artist, Robert Motherwell, was a bridge between continents. At once, a spokesman for the New York School and a conduit for the theories of European modernism. He described his working process as follows. I begin painting with a series of mistakes. The painting comes out of the corrections of the mistakes by feeling. 
I begin with shapes and colors, which are not regulated, regulated internally, nor to the external world. I work without images. So in other words, he's just trying stuff. He's putting, putting marks down, putting shapes down, and then adjusting them until, until they come to a place where he's satisfied with them. Um, and there's this wonderful collage over here, personage. Um, now, the interesting part about, about how Motherwell came to his, his, his practice, um, he really was um, young enough so that, so that he was not um, part of the WPA and not part of the battle between abstraction and representation that was taking place in, in American art from the turn of the century through the 30s into the 40s. Um, and basically the, you know, the abstraction was kind of um, looked upon as this kind of freak um, thing that was going on at, at that time um, in America. American regionalism and realism were, were very strong um, in the, in, you know, in between the wars, uh, you know, and in the WPA, a lot of the mural projects were representational, though there were some, Arshel Gorky and, and um, uh, Stuart Davis both made large scale abstract um, uh, murals for the WPA. Anyway, um, that's an aside. Okay. But I just love the quality of these of these these uh, wonderful mixed media pieces. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, so again, you know these, you know the the um, just reading the the materials, pastel, paste, paste. Uh, Wood pasted wood veneer, tempera, ink, oil. You know, he's just throwing everything at these things and and kind of coordinating them and and pulling them together. Beautiful, beautiful um, color sensibility in in these pieces. You know, accents of really bright colors, but but also, you know, big fields of 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 kind of pastel neutral colors. And so to put collage in context, um, I included a Kirchfitters here. Actually, the, the, um, the Picasso was earlier. Um, and we know that Brock and Picasso both experimented with, with collage, mixed in with their, their, um, their cubist approaches. Um, Kurt Schwitters was a member of the Dadaist movement. Um, the, the interesting part about this is, you know, um, he, he was really considered revolutionary at the time using, you know, it, it would shock the public to have these, these uh, collages. I look at this thing now and it's, it's such an elegant, um, study in adjacent colors in the color wheel, colors next to each other that harmonize with each other. Um, the use of texture and the, and the layering and all of that, very beautiful to me. Um, it's a very small piece. It's, it's, only, it's only five by four inches, um, but really monumental in its, in its impact when you see it on the screen here. Um, and then off on, on the, the uh, right here is Arthur Dove, who was an American modernist early in the 20th century. And he also used um, collage. And this is a really funny piece. You know, the critic, he's like got a vacuum cleaner in his hand. Uh, 
and he's on, I believe he's on roller skates. <laughs> so he skates his way through sucking in information from the show that he's looking at. Anyway, uh, pretty funny. Okay. And so in 1943, um, I believe it was 43 when, when um, Motherwell went to Mexico and he actually made contact with uh, Roberto Mata, who was a, you know, a surrealist um, from, from that group, but, but very much in um, the Mexican um, take on surrealism has a real political bent. It, it definitely integrates politics and, and political satire into the work. Now, this particular piece that I'm showing here, I don't think it's so much about that. Um, this is a late piece. It was from 1991. So uh, Mata would have been fairly old at that point. Um, but Pancho Villa, um, this is a, a, a piece at the time, you know, kind of still relevant from the Mexican Revolution and, and all that. So it's 1943. You know, that there are all these black holes in it. Um, maybe they're hinting at bullet holes. I don't, I don't know. But, you know, it was a very turbulent time. You know, America was in World War II at that point. So again, um, I I see I see this piece on on the left as as being a nod to the late Paul Clay who died in uh, I believe it was 1943 if I'm not wrong, um, and his late work was was really these much bolder um marks and larger scale um from from what he was known for earlier in his career and there is a kind of anxiety in this piece that really you know it it, it, it was timely um and the little spanish prison now this is an interesting piece because if you look at the dates on this thing, it's not not a very large piece, but but um, it was started in 1941, revised in 44, and in 59, and in 69. This is a process that he a practice that he would repeat um, throughout his career, coming back to paintings, doing something, and then coming back to it and redoing it, reworking it, modifying it in some way. That, that magenta rectangle that's, that's up at the top changed several times in the process of the painting, at least four times that, that, that are listed that I know of. It was, it was black, it was blue, it was uh, a couple of other colors, I think. And then he landed at this kind of festive magenta, uh, I'll say. Um, and maybe it's a signifier of liberation, or maybe it's a signifier of death. I don't know. Uh, I, he was very hesitant about ascribing specific meanings to his work. The, the meaning was in the paint. Um, but I'll talk more about that too. Okay. And here we have, um, uh, the pink mirror, um, another co wonderful collage from 1946. Um, I see in this some correlations to Picasso and Matisse, where the, the mirror is, is, is used as a, as a device in the composition. Um, let me see. 
Okay. Um, the inventive use of materials and the subtle link to Matisse and Picasso um, as using the mirror as a compositional device, the play of pattern and geometry is something that I think that, that um, Motherwell's intelligence would have brought into play in the picture. Okay. In 1950, um, Motherwell was asked to come and teach. He, he actually was teaching at, um, at Hunter College um, throughout the 50s and I believe into the 60s. But he was asked to come in 1950 to um, teach at, at uh, Black Mountain College during the summer. At Black Mountain, he taught people like Rauschenberg, Cy Twombly, uh, Kenneth Nolan, who was a color field painter. Um, Motherwell was very supportive of, 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 these, of these guys and, and really spent quite a bit of time with them. Now, I'll talk a little bit for a moment about Black Mountain, which was an amazing thing, which comes up. The, this, this experience was started in the, the, the late 30s um, when um, the Bauhaus was closed by the Nazis in Germany. Several of the, the key players from, from uh, the Bauhaus, um, uh, Gropius, the, the architect and one of the head um, uh, administrators of the Bauhaus came to America. Joseph Albers and Annie Albers were both there. Um, if you look at this picture, there's, there's actually uh, Jacob Lawrence was there. Um, uh, a number of notables came and went and taught there. Um, De Kooning and, and Motherwell were both teaching there at the same time. So this was quite a fertile place. And, um, and Rauschenberg um, especially appreciated you know, his, his relationship with Motherwell. Um, Cy Twombly, um, actually Motherwell looked at Twombly's work and said, I, I have nothing to teach you. Keep going with what you're doing. They both had very, very deep literary cores to their work. And, and I think Motherwell appreciated the direction that Twombly was going in. And he actually helped Twombly get into a, a gal his gallery in New York and have his first show in the city. Um, anyway. So, and here is, you know, you can see kind of the the, the sympathy between Motherwell's uh, uh, collage work and the work that, that Rauschenberg was involved in and coming out with. Um, many, of, many of the Rauschenbergs that were done back in the 50s have discolored a great deal because a lot of the junk that he was using was so um, straight off the streets that it deter it's deteriorating quickly. His later work is much more archival, but uh, but the interesting part is to is to see the relationship between shapes and the 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 idea of of this kind of jaunty characteristic of of what was going on at the time and and. The appreciation that Motherwell had for what was contemporaneous, what was happening now, what was new and alive in, in the art world. Okay, so this is an early um, elegy, um, and I'm going to talk a lot more about these because he did a lot of these. He did, he did. I believe somewhere around 150 elegy paintings, many of them very large scale. I mean, you know, like 
seven by 10 feet or no, seven by 20 feet. Um, they, were, they were pretty enormous pieces, many of them. Um, so this is a small scale piece, but it's an early one from 1948-49. And, and actually at five in the afternoon is from a, um, uh, a Lorca, Garcia Lorca poem. Um, and it's about, you know, the death of a revolutionary, um, and what I want to talk a bit about here is the process of applying the paint and the embodiment of the artist's presence in that, in that act. Um, and you can see that texture, that surface on, on this, on this piece. Um, the the kind of hesitant wobbly line in 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 this um, this is a this is really um, it's the play of the wobbly line against the thick, thicker gestural heavier paint this is kind of the development of compositional language that Motherwell is to use throughout the series and many of his other works. Um, so it really is kind of the symbol of grief, of, 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 of loss. Um, but I'll talk more about this as we move along. Ah. And again, this buoyant, the buoyant shapes, the, the, the relationship to modernism, to, to Matisse's, at the time, cutting edge work. I mean, 1947 was, was this series of paper cuts, and he was working on, on these larger scale paper cuts. Motherwell would have been well aware of those, and they, they would have been shown in, in Manhattan. Um, so he would have seen those. And, you know, this dance from 1952 is again you know the the acknowledgement of 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 what was um a breakthrough for matisse okay um and this is a commissioned piece that was done by by motherwell uh, for for a, a synagogue, um, Motherwell and Gottlieb, and I believe there was one other of the abstract expressionist group, um, had pieces that were in this in this um, synagogue. Um, Ninety six, so it's so it's eight feet by one hundred and ninety two inches. So this is this is a very big piece, beautifully done, beautifully designed, um, elegant, using these linear elements through it as a kind of unifying factor, but the, the play of surface and depth of, of things going behind and things coming out in front, um, making the, the, the candelabra come forward at us. Really lovely piece. Okay. And um, Motherwell became kind of the de facto spokesperson for uh, the Abex New York School. Um, this is a very famous shot, um, the irascibles. This is a whole list of, of the cadre of, of artists that were part of that group. There were a bunch of others who weren't included. Uh, some of the women were left out. Um, uh, this shot was in Life magazine. And, and basically, it came out of a controversy over a 1950 show at the Metropolitan Museum 
of new American painting that excluded the Abex painters for the most part. And they drafted an open letter in protest of, of the lack of inclusion of, of the, this group of new painters that were, that were around new. These, these guys were around for a long time and they were certainly not new to the scene, but uh, they were not included in, in, in what was considered um, uh, the mainstream painting in America at that time. And so, you know, basically they got a lot of coverage out of this and, and they earned the nickname, the irascibles. That's where that came from. Oh, and here are examples of their work. I think you can see here that this is a pretty loosely related group. Um, to put them under a single heading of abstract expressionism, um, for me, is a, is a bit of a stretch. Uh, they are all really unique individuals with their own their own um, direction and and avenues of exploration. They share certain things in common. It's it's um, they are non um, representational, shall I say. Uh, not, not that there is no correlation to figurative, because of course, de Kooning and, and Gottlieb, especially in this one, and others explore and use figuration and, 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 um, and abstracted landscape as part of their, their um, body of work you can see the, the diversity of the directions that they were going in. Okay. And here is another, you know, this is, this is a very large scale. The one that I showed you before from the, from the late forties was, was much smaller, but this is, this is, really, um, showing the kind of um, scale of marking and all of that, that that would go on in this series. Um, Motherwell came of age in the 30s, so um, the um, devastation of the Nazi war machine in Spain had a profound impact on him um, and many others. Um, and the, the scale of these pieces is, 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 you know, part of the impact of that, of that grief, of that mourning, of that sense of, of, of kind of ominous um, devastation that was taking place. Now, on the technical side of this, the scale of the pieces, the revision, the, the painting of white over the black, and then the black back over the white, the underpainting, there's colors that are underneath the surface that you can really not see well on the screen. One of the problems with presenting a painter like Motherwell is you can't really get the sense of the texture and the underpainting that's going on beneath that black, which really activates it in a very different way. You know, there are all, you can see some of the shadows of the, the black that's painted over by the white in some of these whiter areas and some of the color that's been painted over by the white. And him allowing those things to be there, those, those marks, those, those underpainting qualities are something that he um, enhanced and wanted to keep. He didn't just accidentally stop at that point. You know, the, the relationship between the drips where he allows them to re remain there are there for a reason. They're there because they activate the composition in a certain way that he was good with. 
and he saw as being something that that was an element that he wanted to keep those edges of the of the big shapes where they're kind of ragged in some areas and straight in others it it acts actually adds to the the interest of the piece and again i will talk more about this as we go along um but seeing seeing one of these in person is something that that is you know really something to be encouraged they they do have i believe one of the larger scale elegies out at the metropolitan in their in their permanent collection and i think if we're lucky they will have shifted things around at the museum of modern art and have one of them out there but i i don't haven't been there lately they keep changing that one um, which is good. So the sense of grief and loss of World War II, the bereavement, the kind of anxiety of the late 40s, early 50s are part of the underlying force of the series. Not that these have a predetermined intent. Um, Motherwell was really, you know, following this, he was allowing it to come out, emerge from his, his understanding um, and his absorption of this. Okay. The shape and form um, of the underpainted color you can see, you know, where that that kind of yellow okra that's underneath the middle, that middle form is still kind of showing through on the edges. Um, and he kept that, you know, on purpose, you know, that that blue line that goes on top of the shape over there and behind the shape over here on the on the right. Um, that. That's a really interesting note. Um, and again, the scale of this piece, 69 by 98. So it's a fairly large scale piece. Ah. The integration of text into his work can be seen as an awareness of, of Rauschenberg and Johns and and um, and Twombly, who, as I said, Motherwell um, got into a gallery, uh, got into his gallery, um, and got him a show in the late fifties. Um, and again, the nod to France, the nod to to European modernism. In 1958, um, Motherwell and Frankenthaler married. Um, they were um, the golden couple <laughs> for a period of time. Uh, they threw lavish parties. They were both from, you know, wealth and and um, were socially connected um, and also connected to the art world. Very, you know, um, wide circle of, of intellectual and artistic um, uh, friends and uh, fellow workers in, in, in the field. Um, so they were known to show to throw these wonderful parties and and um, and they were very um, again they were really both quite well developed individuals and were able to hold their own identity standing up next to another creative giant, actually, in my opinion. Um, 
So they were both really self-possessed when they met already and quite, quite their own people. Um, and here's, here's examples of, of things that were contemporaneous to around the time they married and um, wonderful kind of buoyant pieces. In the 60s, Motherwell found, um, well, let, let me go back. Um, the integration of, of um, of color as, as a, as a, um, a field of exploration for Motherwell was quite extraordinary. And, Again, a nod to the color field painters. This was, you know, painted in 63, 64. Frankenthaler and the color field painters of Washington, DC were on the ascendancy and Motherwell was not to be left behind. Um, but again, there's this underlying political message behind this, the, the, the activity of what was going on in Ireland at, at that time played part in, 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 in this piece. I'm not quite clear about that and I hadn't read the full um, uh, background of the time and what that significance is, but here we have it. But it's definitely a color field painting. <clears throat> okay. So, um, the integration of, of, um, of color, of, of sky, blood, and earth into the series of elegies um, is a change from the, the previous pieces from the 40s into the 50s. Um, so, this is something which would be integrated into the, the, the series as it goes forward from here. He continued to do these. He did, um, I believe, like I said, I believe he did 120 to 150 of the elegies in various forms, um, drawings, large scale paintings, um, prints, Um, in the mid sixties, Motherwell found himself kind of a little bit stuck and he went into an art supply store and he was buying something for, I don't, I can't remember what that, what, what he was buying and why he was buying it there. He was buying some paper and, and they had in stock all this wonderful Japanese paper. And so he bought a thousand sheets of of this, of this Japanese paper and decided that he was going to paint all thousand pieces straight on and not look back, just paint them and put them aside as soon as they were done painting um, and not revise them and not revisit them until, until he was done. And he commenced to do that. Now, by this time, um, Motherwell and Frankenthaler had bought a house in, in Provincetown um, overlooking the sea. And so he went at it, as you can see, beside the sea, number 41. Uh, many of these were painted in, in relationship to the surf, to the, to the waves, to the, the ocean, the sense of, of that, that, that swirling wave-like quality. Um, it's also very much a Zen kind of boom, hit, hit that brush to the paper and let it be. Let the vitality of the brushwork stand. 
um, so he kind of worked his way through his painter's block by just allowing himself to let this kind of this is this is this is typically what what you would call automatic writing. It is this process of allowing whatever com comes out to come out and letting it be. Don't don't modify it. Don't mess with it. Just let it come. Um, so he got through 600 of these and a close friend of his, um, David Smith, the sculptor who Motherwell had known from all the way back in the in the in the forties, they were very close. And mother, um, actually, um, David Smith died suddenly in a in a car accident, and that was actually the close of this series. He just didn't come back to it at this time. He did repeat this process later on in his career when he would feel stuck. He would allow himself to loosen up and 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 just let these things flow out. But um, that, that, was, that was that for that part of this. Um, and in 1971, um, the golden couple went their own separate ways. Uh, after 13 years of marriage, Motherwell and Frankenthaler um, parted ways. And, um, Motherwell bought a a uh, a big barn with a an adjoining cottage and another outbuilding in Greenwich, Connecticut, um, some thirteen thousand square feet of of spaces in different places. So he set himself up a studio for his painting a studio for his collage, a studio for drawing and printing, printmaking. Um, so this was a real, you know, change to have these separate spaces to allow himself to designate those spaces for that kind of thing. And okay, this gives you some idea of the scale of this. Is. Um, really, you know, when you see when you see a human being in relationship to the size of these pieces, you get some idea of the impact of 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 them. Um, and this is from 72, 75. And here is a detail of that piece. And I'm gonna actually zoom in if I can get the zoom to work. Let's see. Zoom in on this a bit so you can kind of see some of what I'm talking about. It pixelates a bit, but you get the idea of the subtlety of the mark making in these black masses. They aren't just flat, flatly painted. They aren't evenly painted. It's the paint application. It's how he put the paint on. The interesting part is there is actually a, um, uh, a film on a uh, canopy that that is Motherwell. Um, it was from, I believe it was from 1972 or something like that. Um, and it shows him painting and it's well worth watching just for those, those minutes of watching him put the paint on and getting more of a grasp of, of how that paint texture, how significant that is to the quality of these pieces, um, well worth well worth a watch. Um, let's see. Uh, again, face of the night for Tavio Pez. Um, again, the relationship to poetry, uh, to philosophy. These the 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 notions that come out of those things were quite crucial to the inspiration for him. Now we as viewers, we don't know what that means unless we were to read that poem and try and 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 hold this in our in our imaginations or look back at it. We might get more of a grasp of where of of the feel of what it was that he that that 
Motherwell's after. Um, but it's a powerful piece and large scale. Again, 72 by 180 inches. Um, okay. And um, again, the, the, the business of the relationship between the line and form becomes very important in activating a composition like this. Um, and this is, you know, graphite, it's pencil underneath the paint. Again, same technique um, uh, and a um, a literary reference to Eliot to um, the wasteland. Um, okay, and this is the last place I want to go at this point. Um, uh, this open series was hard for me to get at first. I wasn't quite with them with these because they're they get very minimalist and all of that. And I was having a hard time with it until I started to think about his relationship to Matisse and, and this wonderful window piece by Matisse, this very abstract, wonderful minimalist piece. And, you know, again, for Matisse, the underpainting, the color that's underneath that black would be showing through if we were to see it in person. And, and these colors and Again, back to this linear element, and I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. Um, the the lost and found, the jagged quality of it, where the where the planes meet. Um, it it really is Matisse and modernism, the activation of the flat surface through line and form, through how two planes meet. Um, Motherwell, Motherwell painted this slightly jagged line as a device that he uses to catch the eye, to create a vibrating interest where those two flat planes meet. So it's not just a straight, clean line. It, it's, this, it's this undulating quality. And again, you know the the um, the window, the canvas, the the canvas leaning against the canvas. If you remember the red the red studio where Matisse paints out paints his paintings in, and the entire studio is red. Um, you know the the windows out into the world are his canvases, not not. Uh, uh, realistically painted um, perspectival areas. And this premonition open with flesh over gray, you know, the, the kind of um, uh, surface and depth of the paint this underpainting, kind of the gray underpainting is, is showing through in some areas. And the brushwork is very important in, in, a, in a piece like this. The window. So again, in, in Western art, the window is, is really you know, the canvas, the painting, the, the, the window into the world of the unconscious or the window into the world of the artist. Um, and Motherwell is cutting back and cutting back. Ah. And so um, Barnett Newman, also concerned with line and plane and where those things meet. Um, he did a series 
called the Stations of the Cross, um, which ascribe a spiritual significance to the meeting of line and plane, that place between hovering. Um, in the Judaic tradition, the unnamed presence of God. Um, and and th that's not going beyond the notions that these guys were carrying. So I am going to end it there. <laughs> um, it was really wonderful being able to explore this guy's work. Um, and and uh, I hope that you know, you guys get to see some in person. I'm looking forward to getting to see them the next time I get into the city. And uh, so the next talk we're going to do is beginning in, in uh, January. I don't have the date in my head, but um, we're going to be going to, I'm going to go to a show that's happening at the Whitney, which is an early exploration of AI by an artist who is there. And this is going to be an interesting uh, thing for us all to discover. So thank you all for coming. Okay, thank you. Wait, uh, there's one. Oh, just a, a thank you. Okay. okay.